such a morning as well as afternoon is indeed what's lying ahead all of us. I'm Prakya Pandey, executive of our department. Today, no other moment could have been better and prouder than to have this amazing opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of our entire department. The three-day journey that started on 22nd October 2020 with an intriguing panel discussion with two of the ST panelists on a very essential topic that is India and United Nations has now reached to its concluding day on which we are having a webinar led by two prominent ambassadors who will be sharing their precious knowledge as well as their own experiences with all of us on two different yet related topics. Our conclave, Britain Vocalizing Visions, is dedicated to the United Nations Day celebrated on 24th October every year, that is today. And this year, we are witnessing its 75th anniversary, hence its Diamond Jubilee. On the same date of the year 1945, 51 countries came together to live with the purpose of promoting peace and cooperation around the world. In 1947, the United Nations General Assembly declared 24th October the anniversary of the Charter of the United Nations, as which, quote-unquote, shall be devoted to making known to the people of the world the aims and achievements of the United Nations and to gaining their support for its work. Today, in order to elaborate on the position of United Nations during the COVID pandemic, we have with us Ambassador Dilip Sinha, sir. I would now like to introduce Sinha, sir, to our audience. Sir is an Indian diplomat and former public administrator. He joined the Indian Foreign Services in 1978, where he served until 2014. He was the director in the Prime Minister's Office India from 1992 to 1995, during Mr. P. Narsimha Rao's tenure. Next to which, he served as India's ambassador to Greece from 2007 to 2010. Then again at the Ministry of External Affairs, India, he served as Special Secretary and Additional Secretary from 2010 to 2012. Also, Sir headed India's UN Affairs during his membership of the Security Council in the eventful period from 2011 to 2012. From 2012 to 14, he served as India's Ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva, during which he was also elected as the Vice President of the UN Human Rights Council and Vice Chairman of the South Center. During his diplomatic career, Sinha Sir served in Germany, Egypt, Pakistan, Brazil, Bangladesh, and Greece. Apart from his profession, Sir is also a public speaker on international security and environmental diplomacy. Moreover, in 2018, Sir authored one of the significant works titled as Legitimacy of Power, the permanence of five in the Security Council. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Haukum Vepe, sir, Assistant Professor of our department, to officially welcome Sinha, sir, as well as address the gathering. Over to you, sir. A very good morning to everyone who are gathered here today. It is my pleasure to welcome all the participants on the final day of Return Vocalizing Visions. It is indeed a special privilege to welcome our eminent speaker, Ambassador Dilip Sinha, distinguished diplomat, public administrator, writer, and public speaker who have come here to share his knowledge and vast experience with the student community. This is the first webinar in the history of our department, which is completely conducted on a digital platform in line with social distancing norms due to COVID-19 pandemic. The theme of today panel discussion is titled, The Position of the United Nations During and Post Pandemic. In my opinion, the time is now right to reflect upon a number of questions. Today, the United Nations is at the crossroad to the future. History taught us the fact that crisis catalyzed states to rise above inertia, myopia, and narrow self-interest. This was reflected in the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, conferences of Britain Woods and San Francisco in the 1940s. The present pandemic is similar to the crisis that can lead to tectonic shift in the global affairs. Against this background, it is pertinent to answer some of the puzzles before us in understanding the position of the United Nations organization given the global pandemic. I am confident that this session will help expand our mental horizons and help us understand the dynamics of the United Nations in the midst of 
COVID-19 pandemic. A very warm welcome to you, Ambassador Dilip Sinha. Over to you, Ambassador Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hawkam. And uh, thank you to the Political Science Students Association of uh, Delhi University, St. Venkatesara College students, and your own faculty for this uh, honor that you have given me to speak to you on this uh, topic, which is uh, extremely current, the, the UN and the pandemic. And since you're all students of political science, so I'll jump straight to the topic and uh, not give any introductory lecture to you on what the UN is, et cetera, et cetera, it's just because you're familiar with all this. Now, this, this, this pandemic, this COVID pandemic has come at a very difficult time for the world and for the UN. The global economy, as you know, has been in trouble since the global financial crisis of 2008. The recovery after that crisis was sluggish. And uh, what is most significant is that there has been strong sentiments against globalization, especially in the West. And a lot of the sentiments against globalization was directed against China, which uh, many Western countries feel and many other countries feel has been the biggest beneficiary of globalization and it has been a beneficiary by gaming the system. And this pandemic having originated from China has accentuated the resentment against the country. Uh, in addition, the UN has also faced the problem of polarization within the US uh, and the weakening support within the US and its administration of the UN. This was visible even before. Uh, there is also an unwillingness in the US to support the current international order. Uh, the other major supporter of the international order that is Europe, the European Union, uh, has been in a lot of internal trouble. It is essentially engaged in uh, internal coordination. And there have also been differences that have cropped up over the last few years between the US and the EU, which again weakens the UN because these two have been the main supporters of the international order that was set up after the Second World War. Uh, Russia uh, was never a vigorous member of this international order and of late has been facing sanctions from the West. So it again is, has no reason to, to support the international order. It is decidedly hostile to it. And in this atmosphere, uh, China has, uh, has moved in, finding the field open for itself and has been trying to increase its control over the existing international organizations while at the same time undermining them and trying to develop its own institutions. So the UN and its agencies have been faced with this pandemic at a time uh, when this uh, global economy was weak, as I mentioned, and the pandemic has had a devastating impact on some of the major functions of the UN, uh, primarily relating to development, especially human development, relating to humanitarian relief and attaining the targets of the sustainable development goals by 2030. Now, all organs of the UN are affected by this pandemic and are struggling to deal with it. Uh, we do not know how long the pandemic will last and whether and when sustained global economic recovery will take place, but it is certain that the existing trends that I have mentioned will get accelerated by this pandemic. Now the change that will take place need not necessarily be structural. The structures, the international organizations that we have, the special agencies of the UN, they may well remain where they are, but they will adapt themselves to the new forces and ideas as time passes. And I'll explain this as we go along. Uh, let's look at the, the, the very idea of a pandemic affecting uh, global, the global economy and global institutions. The last such pan big pandemic was the Spanish flu of 1918, which you all must have watched, yourself, made yourself familiar with. Uh, 500 million people were affected, 50 million people died. And yet you find that there's hardly any public memory of this pandemic. So what happened? Why didn't the people remember the Spanish flu the way, for example, the, the Black Death of the 14th century had made an impact on the minds of the people of Europe. Uh, we don't know the answer to this, except that perhaps the Spanish flu was uh, 
followed by a, an, a, a major economic recovery. And there was the boom of the 1920s in Europe and America. And perhaps also because a lot of the devastation of the Spanish flu got mixed up with the First World War. So the argument that is made sometimes is that, you know, this pandemic is the COVID pandemic is there, but it's uh, very soon it will go away. Once it goes away, people will forget about it, just as they forgot about the Spanish flu. But this may not necessarily happen. Uh, this global pandemic has caused the deepest global recession since the Second World War. And it is the first pandemic since uh, that has been solely due to, so the first recession that has been solely due to a pandemic. And uh, this, of course, uh, includes the fact that uh, the counting of global statistics, et cetera, started in 1870. So uh, it is from this period that I'm mentioning this. Now, what has been the impact of this COVID? I'll just very briefly mention some of the figures that are floating around all over the place. The global GDP fell, will, is likely to fall by about 4.4% this year, according to the IMF. Uh, the US economy will collapse by about the same figure. China is the only major country that is likely to grow, perhaps by 2%. India's GDP is likely to go down by about 10%. The social impact is even graver. 500 million jobs lost. 100 million people pushed below the poverty line. Uh, international travel industry and international hospitality industry in extremely dire straits. FDI has fallen by around 40%. And the UNDP estimates that the human development index is likely to fall for the first time since 1990. And the attainment of the sustainable development goals, uh, the current uh, period as you know is from 2015 to 2030, which means the UN has up to 2030 to attain these goals. But that appears to be difficult, as I said, because 100 million people have fallen below the poverty line and uh, statistics of health all over the world have been skewed by this pandemic. Uh, apart from this, there's also the, uh, the rather sinister downside visible of this pandemic. And that is the increase in government surveillance and the technology for surveillance. Uh, most countries have, have been doing this, but China has developed and implemented its extremely sophisticated technologies in this. And there is the fear that uh, in the garb of uh, taking care of public health and the necessity of monitoring, monitoring public behavior, governments will start using this technology more and more. And this will impact the other goals of the UN of um, open societies, freedom, and uh, promoting human rights. Uh, this Especially so when you look at the fact that the countries most badly affected by the COVID are liberal open democracies. You have the US, you have Brazil, you have India at the top of the list. Uh, whereas China uh, with its uh, extremely uh, harsh and autocratic measures has been able to control the pandemic. At least that's what the reports indicate. And perhaps the only positive impact that you can think of of the COVID is that uh, carbon dioxide emissions fell by 8.8% in the first half of 2020. And this was the first time this has happened uh, in, in the last several uh, decades, I would think. Uh, we could all ourselves notice uh, that our cities were cleaner during this period. But of course, as economic activity revives, and you can see in Delhi itself, uh, pollution is back. But what this uh, COVID pandemic has established is that the CO2 emissions can be controlled. And if one controls them, then the impact on the environment can be seen and will be visible. So it is something that, that can be done if the world puts its, uh, um, um, gets down to it. Now let's come to the main organization that has dealt with this pandemic or is responsible for dealing with this pandemic, which is the World Health Organization. The WHO, as you know, is one of the specialized, one of the 15 specialized agencies of the UN, formed in 1948 after amalgamating a number of earlier health organizations, including the Health Organization of the League of Nations. It has 194 members. Uh, it has its own assembly, the World Health Assembly. It has its own budget. Operationally, it is independent of the UN, but uh, they are all linked under the UN umbrella, uh, as all specialized agencies are. It's uh, 
budget is uh, 2.4 billion dollars annually but here comes the catch only 20% of it comes from assessed contributions of member states now the assessed contributions are the regular budget of the organization which is controlled by the world health assembly and world health assembly then decides how it's going to be spent the remaining 80% comes from governments and from private entities including pharmaceutical companies through voluntary donations and there's always this this feeling and often open criticism of the fact that these voluntary donations are directed again into specific programs that the donor wishes to uh, wishes to be carried out and therefore these voluntary donations impact the programs and priorities of the organization and this has been coming up in the past also so this is one of the difficulties that an organization like who faces but fortunately in the pandemic all governments have come together to to deal with the matter of course there has been this other criticism uh, of the who that uh, the influence of china was um, strong and perhaps uh, it, it led to the who being negligent in the early stages both in in warning the world about the pandemic and also perhaps in uh, taking action in identifying the causes of the pandemic uh, where it came from and the origins of it uh in terms of the longer term impact of the pandemic uh, it's difficult to predict how much uh, this will uh, this will be there because we don't know how long the pandemic will last uh certainly the disenchantment with globalization and the rise of protectionism will become stronger and this will impact many of the organizations that deal with these subjects especially the wto the world trade organization which is not a specialized agency of the un but it is related to the un so it is part of the global international organizations the wto itself was already in trouble even before the us had been uh, unwilling to let anybody be nominated to the appellate tribunal which impacted the dispute settlement mechanism of the wto which has been now lying dormant for some time uh, now with the pandemic and the rise in protectionism one can expect that the wto will go into further hibernation as it is they are trying to elect the the dg and they are through that process right now uh the other is that the free trade agreements that were in the pipeline earlier uh they've already they have slowed down the tpp the trans pacific uh, partnership had had been abandoned by the us india had walked out of the uh, rcep the doha development round of the wto uh, was as good as dead so one can expect that free trade agreements uh, will also slow down because of this pandemic uh in terms of the uh, the impact of the uh, covid one can also find that there has been a, a crash in demand all across the world and governments are trying to stimulate demand by pumping uh, giving fiscal stimulus stimuli to the economy and the total stimulus so far has been by governments is amounts to 11 trillion dollars which is about 12% of the gdp now if you compare this with uh, what happened when the 2008 global financial crisis took place you found find that at that time the total stimulus was only 3 trillion dollars so the current stimulus is much more than the earlier one and the organization that deals with this matter and generally advises countries is the imf the international monetary fund and the international monetary fund uh, surprisingly has opened its coffers uh, and um, since march 2020 it has expanded its lending by almost one third so its total lending is now about 280 280 billion dollars it has become extremely liberal in releasing funds to countries that have gone to it for uh, for liquidity and for balance of payments problems and the uh, the imf self advising governments that they must uh, pay attention to public health and also provide enough liquidity to the system to be able to uh, meet with the uh, crash in demand that the economies are facing uh, and this coming from the imf which is the bastion of the free market economy and has always upheld that government should not interfere in the economy this is a major development uh, 
for it. Uh, in fact, the uh, the IMF has also been talking about the fact uh, about the need for a comprehensive agreement on digital taxation. Now, this again is a, is, a, is a new concept because you do not have any international agreement so far on taxing companies that are multinational. Taxation is a, is a, is a national prerogative of national governments. But because of this globalization and companies moving into tax havens, mm -hmm. uh, governments have been facing the problem of how do you tax these multinational companies especially digital companies. And if you look at all the top companies in the world, whether it is Amazon or it is uh, other companies, Google, they are all digital companies which can move very easily from one headquarters to another. And on this, the IMF has said that there is need for a comprehensive agreement on digital taxation. Uh, talk on this is going on both in the European Commission and in the OECD. OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. This is a 37 member body of the advanced economies of the world. It is based in Paris. Uh, so they are talking about this digital uh, of tax global uh, uh, taxation agreement. And also significantly, the IMF has said in its most recent report that governments need to tax the rich to augment their revenue. But this again, as you know, is, is, a, is a new concept for, for the world and for especially for organizations like the IMF, where they are now recognizing the fact that governments need to tax uh, need to increase the tax taxation revenue, and this includes taxing the rich. Another key advice that has come uh, from one of the UN organizations is from UNCTAD, which has said that there should be a peace clause, a peace clause like you have in a, in a, in a, in a, in a war agreement or a ceasefire agreement, in a peace clause on WTO treaties. The WTO treaties, as you know, are treaties like TRIPS in particular, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Treaty, they have this general impression that these treaties, especially TRIPS, prevents governments from uh, uh, providing medicines to the poor at affordable rates because of uh, all kinds of licensing and patenting uh, rights and problems. So UNCTAD has advised that uh, there, there, there should be a, a temporary peace clause on the, in WTO treaties to enable governments to provide for compulsory licensing and for other means to be able to provide medicines to the poor at affordable rates. And the WTO itself has released uh, uh, its own uh, information saying that reassuring countries that WTO treaties do not prevent them from taking steps to provide uh, medicines to the poor at affordable rates. So this again is a change from the situation, let's say 10 years ago, when most UN institutions would be advising countries to be strict about non-interference in the economy and uh, not uh, violating intellectual property rights, uh, etc., and not taxing too much. Then I'll come to the, the other part, which is uh, which, which accentuates the problem for the UN is China's rise. Now, uh, China, as you know, is a late entrant to the international order. It became a member of the UN only in 1971. It became a member of IMF and World Bank in 1980 and of the WTO in 2001. Uh, but thereafter, China's rise has been so phenomenal that um, it, is, um, it, it becomes in fact the most, uh, the most uh, defining change in the international order in the last uh, two to three decades. But why is China's rise considered to be a challenge for the UN? Uh, now let's look at China's record. Uh, China shows very little commitment, in fact, no commitment to the values of the UN like democracy, human rights, peaceful settlement of disputes. It is the only major country that, has not, that is not a party to uh, the most basic of the international covenants, which is the international covenant on civil and political rights. I think about 176, 177 countries have ratified this, this, this treaty. Uh, besides, uh, China uh, has constantly had this feeling that it must use force to settle international disputes, whether it is saber rattling against Taiwan, or it is rejecting international arbitration in South China Sea. And the other is this uh, desire of China to dominate the UN and its specialized agencies. You'd be surprised to know that of the 15 specialized agencies of the UN, 
Chinese nationals had four of them, UNIDO, ICAO, ITU, and uh, one more, I forget the name now. Now, no other country has ever dominated or headed four organizations at the same time. But not satisfied with this, China in March this year wanted to contest the DG ship of WIP or the World Intellectual Property Organization. And it lost only in the last round to Singapore. So apart from this desire, China also adopts the technique that the Western countries have been adopting to control international organizations. I mentioned about the voluntary donations to uh, WHO. Now, voluntary donations are used by the Western countries uh, in almost all international organizations to control them and to control their activities. And there's another technique that they use, which is that they are permitted to, a country is permitted to deploy uh, its own staff, its own government staff as, uh, as, uh, as professionals in international organizations. The international organization does not pay the salaries or meet the expenses of this officer. So they are being paid for by the donor country. Now this again is, 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 is I, I would think it's, it's, a, it's against the spirit of the international organization because international civil servants are supposed to be international in character, it's supposed to be neutral. But when a country deputes its own uh, personnel to these organizations on a voluntary basis, uh, they work for the government that pays them. And China has adopted these techniques and places its people in, in different organizations. And of course, there are other reports and charges about uh, China using other underhand means as well. Now, the result of this has been that uh, the, the, the UN is faced with further antagonism among its major members, meaning essentially the permanent five, because uh, you know, the permanent five, although the permanent five concept is there only in the Security Council, the fact is that in the other organizations also, the permanent five do have much greater influence than other organizations because of their structural position in the Security Council. But the EU has recently designated China as a systemic rival. So this again increases the antagonism among the permanent five, uh, and these being the major members, they affect the functioning of the UN on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, uh, Japan has recently uh, followed a policy of encouraging its companies to leave China and has earmarked $3.2 billion to support companies, Japanese companies, which leave China. So all this antagonism among the major countries affects the functioning of an intergovernmental organization like the UN. Now, uh, the Security Council, of course, as we know, uh, has been deadlocked for uh, a long period of time, uh, especially since about 2011, when the last major resolution was passed uh, by the US on, uh, on Libya, which resulted in Russia and China thereafter joining hands not to allow any further action by the Security Council, whether it was in uh, Syria or in Yemen, so the UN is now reduced to merely sending special envoys to war zone countries to try and see if they can agree upon a ceasefire. And the most recent success of this has been the special envoy uh, to Libya, where uh, yesterday they had a they managed to sign an agreement. But no further action, like the Security Council is authorized to take military action or to impose sanctions, these have not been permitted by uh, China and Russia. And with the pandemic and the antagonism among the P5 increasing, the chances of these recede uh, further. Uh, the other uh, difficulty that you face is this for the UN. Is the model that China is offering to other developing countries uh, to deal with situations like the pandemic? I mentioned to you that uh, the pandemic has had its worst impact on liberal democracies and the least on a country like China. And China is actually offering itself as a role model for developing countries. It's one party rule system and it's authoritarian regime. And claiming that this is good, not only for promoting accelerated and faster development, but also for dealing with pandemics like COVID-19. So we have a situation where 
the present UN machinery, its various international organizations, various uh, specialized agencies and its other organs are facing uh, a major problem. The question is, uh, what are the prospects of change in this? Now, if you look at the state of the, uh, the degree of consensus and agreement that exists today among the major powers, you'll understand that this is almost impossible. Countries will just not be able to agree upon uh, any kind of change, just as they're not able to agree upon any change in the UN Security Council, any other reform in any of the international organizations appears to be extremely difficult. Let's look at the actual experience. In the WTO, the US has been clamoring for reforms, but between the US and the EU itself, there has been no agreement on what kind of reforms should be carried out. Uh, the US and the EU have been trying to harmonize their laws in finan the financial sector, like banking standards, liquidity requirements, clearing houses, etc. But they have not been able to come to an agreement because of all kinds of economic and political differences. And the likelihood of an agreement taking place between the US and EU on the one side and China and Russia on the other are as good as non-existent. So what you have is that the current fluid situation is likely to continue. The US and China will continue to influence each other and jostle for, uh, for power. And uh, in this kind of a situation, the other countries just have to sit and wait for international organizations to become more active or to be able to overcome their differences. Now, this need not necessarily be a bad situation for other countries because when the big powers unite, then we have seen what happened in the 1990s when all kinds of uh, military invasions took place. So differences among the top five are not necessarily bad for the other countries. But, and this brings me to the last part of uh, my talk, which is what are the implications of this for India? That this can be considered an opportunity for a country like India, that is uh, to be able to play a, a bigger role as India did perhaps in the, in the 1950s and 60s when the Cold War was going on. And in the Security Council, the US and the Soviet Union were at loggerheads. At that time, India played a very prominent role in the General Assembly uh, in promoting decolonization, disarmament, uh, anti-apartheid movement. So is this possible in this present environment? Uh, and I think that, of course, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an idea that will have is possible only if uh, India were to be able to seize this opportunity. Because the most important problem with India today is that its own economic growth is not fast enough for it to become a major player uh, in, in the global economy. And the other problem is that in a Cold War situation between the US and China, India cannot afford to be non-aligned as it was in the Cold War because none of the two big powers in the Cold War had anything against India as such. So India faced no security threat from either of those two. But in the case of a Cold War between China and the US, India has security concerns with one of the two parties, mainly China. So uh, India will have to be constantly conscious of the fact that if it tries to promote cooperation with China, then there are certain security implications that we'll have to deal with. And the given the antagonism between China and the US, if India leans towards the US, then China becomes even more hostile to India. So in this uh, atmosphere for India to balance the two and to promote its own interests will be a challenge, including uh, in, in, in increasing cooperation with the West because increasing cooperation with the West and integrating India's economy with the West will also require major changes and major reforms in the country, which had started in 1990, but have not been completed and still is a long uh, task. So uh, this pandemic has, uh, as I said, made the situation extremely difficult for the UN and its organizations and also for a country like India. There are opportunities for, for both to uh, make changes and move ahead, but that will depend upon their uh, the capacity in the case of the UN or being able to get the member states to it and the case of India to get our own government and people to move uh, forward in this direction. So I'll conclude with this. Thank you. That was indeed a very thought provoking as well as insightful session, sir. And all the points that you have mentioned, 
were really, I mean, like they covered the topic in a very nuanced manner. Thank you so much, sir, for that. Now, moving on, I would like to initiate the question and answer session. Our team has already gathered some questions, which I'll be calling out the names of the people who have asked those questions, and they will have to use the feature or uh, hand uh, hey, uh, feature or thumbs up feature so that they will be unmuted. So the first question was asked by Ayush. So if you want to ask the question, you can unmute yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, good morning, sir. Thank morning. you for your enlightening session. So I have a question that uh, is it possible for any country to dictate WHO as it is said about China holding WHO back? And if so, then what's the solution? Uh, that is the problem that all international organizations face, that they are after all intergovernmental organizations and uh, the UN has this other characteristic, uh, this feature in its charter that uh, it is not supposed to interfere in matters that are essentially within the internal jurisdiction of a country. So uh, what happens inside a country uh, if a disease breaks out is essentially an internal matter of the country and the WHO or any other international organization can come in only in cooperation with the government uh, to help the country out. Now, will this change with this pandemic? Well, there certainly is a demand for this, that this must change because in a globalized world, no country can live like a fortress. But at the moment, there is, there is no prospect of this. Uh, China, of course, uh, will be under tremendous amount of pressure to open up further. Uh, otherwise, it, will, it might face, um, uh, face at least opprobrium. Sanctions is a very strong word, perhaps not, not likely against China. Uh, but if it were a, a smaller country, uh, let's say there are certain countries in Africa, then it might face travel restrictions because of the disease, or it might even face sanctions. But um, that is unlikely against China. And the fact that China is a major economic power, uh, which induces countries to seek closer economic cooperation with it, uh, means that uh, it is very difficult to isolate China uh, economically in the world. So uh, at the moment, there is no answer to this. We have to go along with this as, as uh, globalization increases and we uh, move forward in our concept of international cooperation through international organizations. Thank you, sir. Uh, relating to Chinese economic uh, economic dominance in the world, I have another question that China has been given power of veto in the United Nations. Uh, and we see that Chinese uh, principles are quite contradictory to that of UN, as you mentioned, regarding uh, peaceful conflict resolution and principles of democracy. Then how rightful is it for China to have veto power in that very organization, considering only the economic domination it has in the world and not the principles it abides by. Oh God, that is a very, very sore point. Uh, you know how China got into the UN? Uh, in 1945, when the permanent powers were being decided, there were essentially three main powers at that time, uh, the Soviet Union, Britain, and the US. Uh, President Roosevelt was very keen to bring China in because uh, he had a special interest in China. I don't want to go into the history of it, but it was he who brought China in Churchill was extremely skeptical about China's uh, claim to be a major power. But Roosevelt was adamant and China was brought in. France was brought in because Britain then wanted France to come in. And that is how you had France and China brought in as permanent members of the Security Council. Now, uh, as you know, four years later, the Communist Party came into power in China and uh, the Republic of China became went into Taiwan and uh, the PRC was kept out of the UN till 1971. And in 1971, as you know, there was the uh, Nixon went to China and improved relations with China because uh, the US realized that in the Cold War against the Soviet Union, it was good to have China as an ally. And once the US opened up with China, you had a situation where uh, other countries then started softening towards China. And I think it was Albania that introduced a resolution in the, in the General Assembly simply stating that the seat of China should go to the PRC. And that resolution was adopted by a simple majority, 
76 countries voted for it, out of 133 or something. So it was a very simple majority. The US voted against it. Incidentally, India voted for that resolution. Uh, don't ask me why, but we did. So uh, with that simple resolution, China replaced, PRC replaced R, uh, ROC in the Security Council. And since then, China has been a member of the Security Council. The question whether China uh, accepts UN uh, principles and values or not was never discussed or questioned there. In fact, you'd be also surprised to know that in 1951, there was a resolution of the General Assembly declaring China to be an invader in the Korean War. So China is, has the distinction of being having been declared by the General Assembly an invader country. Of course, way back, that's forgotten now. But that's how it is. Uh, the fact is that once the US had got over to uh, supporting China's membership, uh, the other countries simply fell in line. India, in any case, had never opposed China's membership. In fact, India was a strong proponent of China's membership, PRC's membership. From 1950 itself, we had been supporting it. So you had uh, other countries supporting as well. So the China just, just walked in. And China so far has also been claiming to be uh, a supporter of a multipolar world. So instead of a bipolar, you have a multipolar world. And that is something that uh, countries have, have taken in. Uh, India itself has joined with China in many international organizations. In BRICS, for example, New Development Bank, the, the Contingency Reserve Fund. So it is not as if other countries have, have not have not have been soft towards China. We ourselves have also been soft towards China in the past. Uh, perhaps uh, there was a time in the 1980s, in the period of Deng Xiaoping, etc., when China's policies were slightly more moderate and therefore justified the position. But uh, even then, if you recall, uh, in Deng Xiaoping's time, uh, China had attacked Vietnam, a uh, much smaller country. And of course, uh, now it's a, it's a different leadership in China and uh, it has uh, also under uh, question, but, but that's how it is. Now that China is a member of the permanent member of the Security Council, uh, it is very difficult to remove it from there. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the answer. Now we have another question from Arka Prabha Haldar. Arka Prabha, if you want to ask the question, kindly raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll be reading it out. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, you're having some technical issues in your site. You're not able to... I guess uh, Arka Prabha has also uh, sent his question in the chat and we'll read out uh, his... Yeah, uh, sir, so, uh, he wants to ask that, don't you think uh, with the current attempts made by China in establishing hegemony in the Indo-Pacific as well as China trying to overtake US in trade, this is the right time and context to reform the structure of UNSC and add India as a permanent member. Well, the, the India's claim to a permanent membership is uh, independent of China's uh, role and domination or attempts to dominate the international order. Because India's claim to permanent membership is based upon India's uh, size, it's the size of its economy, its population. And the fact that uh, with India's population, which is uh, what it is, a very large section of the global population, uh, no international organization that does not have India as a member can claim itself, uh, can call itself an international organization. So uh, it is it's but natural uh, and uh, uh, rightful for India to join the Security Council as a permanent member, regardless of China's policies and, and uh, its, uh, its position. Now, the problem, of course, is that uh, China uh, being hostile to India is, uh, does not want India to become a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, totally disregarding the fact that India was one of the major supporters of China in the PRC in the days when it wasn't a member. But that is how it is. Uh, China is uh, opposed to India's membership. And uh, since it has the veto, it, it would be difficult to, for India to become a permanent member of the Security Council uh, as long as China is opposed to it. What can be done about it? 
uh, I really don't know because uh, there are some people who believe that if there is, uh, if China is isolated, if the other countries come forward and uh, support India, and if India becomes uh, and gets overwhelming support internationally, then China will not stand in the way. Now, that is anybody's guess. Will China say no at that time or not? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, what we do know that was is that in 2005, when uh, the G4 had moved the resolution in the General Assembly and was pressing for uh, its resolution for uh, the expansion of the Security Council, at that time, there were uh, two countries that were extremely active in Africa and other smaller countries, persuading them not to vote for the G4 resolution. And these two countries were the US and China. So that gives you a position, uh, a picture of where things stand. The US policy has, I believe, over the years changed, but uh, China's policy certainly hasn't. Okay, so, Shubham, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask that uh, in the pandemic times, uh, we have seen uh, Trump withdrawing uh, US funding from WHO. And then I was looking at the funding structure. So the second highest funder of uh, WHO is actually Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And do you, like, I want to know as to what impact this funding crunch has had on an organization like United Nations, which at the end of the day is simply an international uh, non-governmental organization. So uh, there have been uh, like a lot of... Uh, downsizing of economy of a lot of nations. How has this affected UN's current role and power? And are there any uh, reforms that is to be employed in the financial sector for UN? Funding is, 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 is a major problem for the UN, whether it is the Security Council or it is the other international organizations. Uh, I told you about the funding structure of the WHO where only 20% of its uh, program budget comes from assessed contribution of member states. Assessed contribution means what is the, the, the mandatory contribution that a country must make depending upon the size of its GDP, its share is decided by the WHO and a country has to contribute. Uh, most rich countries or donor countries do not like assessed contribution because the assessed contribution goes into a general pool and it is the uh, general body, the assembly or the general body of that organization that decides how it's going to be spent. The donor country has no control over it. But in the voluntary contributions, the donor country dictates where the money goes and how it's to be spent. Uh, in the Security Council, of course, uh, there is this other problem that the Security Council itself uh, has the assessed contribution, but the peacekeeping forces get money through the extra budgetary resources, which is the peacekeeping fund. Uh, to which countries make contributions. And uh, the peacekeeping contribution for, for fund, for example, uh, has actually gone down very marginally, but in the last biennium to the current biennium, there's a, there's a marginal decline. Now, the, the impact of this is that the Security Council has not started any other peacekeeping operation, uh, any new peacekeeping operation in the last, I think, uh, since 2005, because there are no funds for it. And uh, the, the troop contributing countries are often have to wait for their for the, for the payment to be made by the UN to them. The US, of course, has been negligent in this for a long time, even before China's rise. If you go back to uh, Butros, Butros Ghali, uh, his, one of the major reasons why he had a dispute with the US was, and he couldn't get a second term, was because he, he felt that the US was holding back money and trying to dictate to him. Uh, once he had to go to uh, President, uh, I think it was President Bush or Clinton, one of the two, whom he went to and asking for money for because the US was withholding its contribution. If you remember, I think it was last year that the US uh, withheld its contribution and the UN was in danger of not being able to pay its salaries to its staff. Uh, in the UN, the rule is that if a country does not pay its assessed contribution for two years, or if its dues exceed two years contribution or share, then it loses its voting right. So the US has ensured that while it is always in default, its outstanding amount never exceeds two years of its uh, dues to the UN. So that's how it's able to keep a tight leash 
uh, on the on the UN. China, fortunately, has not adopted this tactic, but China adopts other tactics, uh, which is to use voluntary donations and also very often underhand payments to uh, the secretariat staff and to other uh, officials and delegates of smaller countries. That's it. Okay, so now we have another question from Shubham Swaraj. He's asking that we have been witnessing countries losing faith in multilateral organization. Talk about US funding deduction in UN or Brexit. What can UN do to restore this belief? I'm afraid the UN, uh, it, it, this is a problem that uh, emanates from the member states themselves. Uh, the UN is not a world government. It is an intergovernmental organization all decisions of international organizations are taken by the member states when they meet in the either the assembly of the organization in the case of the un itself the un general assembly decides the budget allocation uh, the assessed contribution etc the major activities are <laughs> uh, in the case of the uh, world uh, who it is the world health assembly and then there's an executive board that takes decisions there is a secretariat, but the secretariat is there to serve the member states. And that becomes uh, a major problem for the, for the UN because uh, if it were only the assessed contributions that were the major part of their funding, then they would have a certain degree of autonomy. But where it is coming through voluntary contributions, then the staff is totally dependent upon the donor country. And in fact, there are jokes in the in the UN and the secretariats of these various international organizations that if you want to keep your job in the secretariat, then you have to prepare a program for which you can get a donor. If there's no donor available, then your program lapses. And once your program lapses, you lose your job and you come back to your country or do whatever. So uh, the, the secretariat staff, for them, it's, it's, it's a question of saving their own jobs rather than worrying about what the UN the special agency can do or what the UN can do. So it is a very difficult situation and uh, the UN itself can't do very much about it. It has to be the, the, the major powers, the major donors who have to agree that their contribution has to be like the way it is in a country where a person paying a tax has no control over how the money is going to be spent. That is the, that's the government's prerogative, but not here in, in the UN and international organizations. So this is something that has to take further time to evolve as you move towards a more uh, globalized world. Now we have the last question from Shreyash Sinha's side. He's saying that, sir, as you mentioned about increased governmental surveillance during this pan uh, pandemic, in some sense, it is even necessary at present. But since we have learned from 9-11 attacks as well, that once the government's put in place surveillance measures, it is very difficult to roll them back again. So how do you think that during this pandemic, when governments have increased their surveillance, how will it be like, how a stop will be put on it by the UN and related organizations? Well, the, the UN can play a, a role in this because the UN will be one place where countries can share ideas. And once you are sitting in an international forum, then it is a country has to project an image of being liberal and open uh, to show to the world that they are not an authoritarian regime back home. So once you sit in an international setting, then it is possible for countries to give, come up with ideas to be able to develop international norms on privacy, uh, which is extremely important in the digital age, uh, on uh, uh, the degree of control that a a government can exercise on data flowing in and out of the country or uh, the, the extent of control that can exercise on its people, uh, especially the degree of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of arresting a person, of uh, put, taking him into custody. Because in the Human Rights Council, for example, you have these various, there are nine major international human rights treaties, which, uh, which uh, seek to uh, identify how much uh, liberty government should provide to its people. Uh, and in these international settings, it is possible to come up with international agreements, which can then be used by the people to put pressure on their own governments to accept 
Now, uh, India, of course, does not accept that, uh, does not permit Indian citizens to appeal directly to international organizations, but some countries do. And in those situations, the government itself can be held answerable in these uh, forums, the committees of the Human Rights Council. But uh, whatever it is, the fact is that when a discussion takes place in an international organization, uh, it is possible to develop international norms uh, and then use them to try and get governments to accept those international norms and respect them so that their international image remains intact. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, sir, for this enlightening session. We all have taken a lot and learned a lot from the session, definitely. So, uh, now we'll, have, we'll be having another session with Nambia, sir. And if you would like to, then you can also be a part of it. It will be a great, great pleasure for all of us. But only if you like to, sir. Thank you. I'll see. If I have some calls coming up here, so I'll turn to these and see. The same number applies? The same yes, uh, sir. Joint can you see me? How are you, sir? Hi, fine, <laughs> fine. How, how, how are you, Dilip? I'm, yeah. I'm fine, sir. I'm fine, yeah. and I look forward to hearing you. I'll certainly keep oh. my audio on. I'll switch off my video so that I don't disturb you. Oh, okay. I look forward to hearing you. Oh, well, there's nothing new that I'm going to say, which is with you <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Please go ahead. Over to you, uh, students. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Ayush, please start. Yeah. Let us begin with the second se session now. Um, hello again, a very didactic afternoon to everyone present here, virtually experiencing this politically edifying seminar. I am Ayush, the Chief Treasurer of Political Science Department. And this is a proud moment for me to have gotten this opportunity of welcoming you on behalf of our department. The three days journey that started on 22nd October with an intriguing panel discussion on two highly esteemed panelists a very essential and urgent topic, India and United Nations, has now reached to its concluding day on which we are having a webinar led by two prominent ambassadors who will be sharing their precious knowledge and experiences on two very related topics of acute importance in today's world and time. As we know that our conclave Vrittan vocalizing vision is dedicated to the United Nations Day, which is celebrated on 24th October every year. And this year we are witnessing its 75th anniversary, hence the Diamond Jubilee of the United Nations. And to elaborate on the future of United Nations in the post-pandemic world, we now have the presence of Ambassador Sir Vijay Nambiar with us. Mr. Vijay Nambiar is a former special advisor of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon from 2012 to 2016. He served as chef de cabinet to the Secretary General at the rank of Under Secretary General. Earlier in 2006, Mr. Nambiar also served as special advisor to Secretary General Kofi Annan. Prior to joining the United Nations, Mr. Nambia served as the Deputy National Security Advisor to the Government of India of the National Security Council Secretariat. He was India's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York from May 2002 till June 2004. Earlier, he served as ambassadors at Algeria, Afghanistan, Malaysia, China, and Pakistan. With this, I invite Dr. Haukum sir to formally invite Ambassador Nambia sir. Haukum sir. A very good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the second session of the final day of the three-day conclave return, vocalizing visions. We are extremely delighted to welcome our eminent speaker, Ambassador Vijay Nambir, distinguished diplomat, public administrator, public speaker, and former chef de cabinet of the United Nations. It is a proud moment for us to have you here to share your expertise, experience, and valuable insights on the United Nations organization. Sir, this is the first webinar in the history of our department, which is completely conducted on a digital platform due to COVID-19 pandemic. Today's session is titled, The Position of the United Nations During and Post-Pandemic. We know all is not well with COVID-19 pandemic, as it spreads across the globe and nations strive to save the people and economies, the United Nations will need to step up to save the world order from collapse. I quote Turkey's ambassador Volkan Boskir, president of the 75th United Nations General Assembly. The outbreak has coincided with the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This is a stark reminder of the importance of effective multilateralism and particularly the crucial role of the UN and its agencies, unquote. With this, it is indeed 
and honor to welcome Ambassador Vijay Nambir on this momentous occasion to throw light on the difficult questions of the United Nations arising out of COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Ambassador, sir. Uh, let me, first of all, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to meet up with all of you on this particular day, which is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Uh, I can't speak about the present and the future without going a little into the past. So you'll excuse me if I perhaps say some things which you probably heard before in the course of your two-day conclave or three-day conclave. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here at the Political Science Department of the Sri Venkateshwara College and uh, to see that uh, you have been uh, gra grappling with a whole series of issues over the past two days. Let me first of all say that the 75 years of the, the United Nations has uh, <clears throat> actually survived is quite an achievement considering that its predecessor, uh, which was formed 100 years ago, the League of Nations, did not even survive for a, for it, it was more or less moribund by a decade and a half. And something therefore must have uh, worked with regard to the United Nations that it was able to, in a sense, reinvent itself and work over the past 70 years and more, 75 years. Now, this reinvention, we have to understand, you know, and the transformations that the UN has been able to achieve over the past 75 years, we must be able to at least understand. It was based on at least one or two major issues. And that is one, if the UN has been able to reinvent itself, it has had to take it, it has had perhaps to take account of certain realities of the international uh, political and geostrategic uh, environment uh, that helped it to survive. And at the same time, it has been able to evolve. Now, the one thing <clears throat> that the people talk about how the UN has evolved over 75 years, uh, it has actually over the, over the years achieved great transformation of uh, the world in a sense. Uh, if you recall, Kofi Annan did talk about certain inspirational uh, concepts which the UN had brought into the world and that itself is seen in its composition, the growth of the United Nations from 52 members to 193 members. That itself uh, was the first big inspirational idea, the idea of independence and decolonization, which started as early as 1960 and which resulted in the phenomenal change that took place in the international political environment and resulted in the independence of states. Then, of course, there was the question of peace. The whole question, as the first secretary, uh, the second secretary general, Dag Hammarskjöld, said, the idea behind the United Nations was not so much to take people to a kind of heavenly state, but to prevent itself from proceeding to, uh, to hell. And that, in the early years of the Cold War, it represented working against the outbreak of another cataclysmic war. And by and large, I think the UN has helped in preventing the outbreak of cataclysmic international conflagration around the world. This is not, of course, meant that there hasn't been conflict. There have been a whole series of conflicts. There have been some incredibly uh, disastrous wars, but many of them have taken place outside the ambit of the United Nations, and the United Nations was not at all involved. This is particularly so in the case of the during the Cold War. Now, <clears throat> in, in, it was in the non-political areas that the UN has actually engaged with the international community and brought out certain staggering transformations around the world. And that is in development, in human, the whole idea of development, uh, particularly during the 90s, when uh, <clears throat> the, uh, under the influence of uh, eminent people like Amartya Sen and Mushir and uh, Mahbub al -Haq, the idea of human development uh, was brought out. And that actually developed into what subsequently became the human, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs, which you now see with uh, 17 uh, strategic, uh, with uh, sustainable development goals and 169 targets. And then of course, the idea of human rights, the questions of, <clears throat> of building charter-based as well as uh, treaty-based, uh, a, a whole regime of issues. These 
represent the basic cha the major changes that have that, that that the UN has been able to bring about in the course of of 50 to 75 years. New concepts like responsibility to protect came particularly after the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the end of the Cold War. Now, <clears throat> in some respects, as I said, the United Nations has had to survive because it has actually uh, <clears throat> stuck to the realities of the international political environment. In this, in this sense, I think the basic structure, what in India we recognize under the in the constitution, under the what is called the Keshav and the Bharati uh, decision, the idea of basic structure applies also to the UN Charter, I think, in some respects. And that basic structure, which is really the power of the P5, the permanent five, has not changed. And that, because it has not changed, I think to an extent that has helped the UN to survive. But I think today, in today's world, when the basic structure, the basic uh, structure of international politics has changed, I think it may be important for the United Nations, if it has to survive as a credible body, to think in terms of reorienting, realigning, the, uh, <clears throat> the basic structure of the United Nations to some of the monumental, some of the, uh, some of the decisive changes that have taken place in the world over the last uh, 10 years, particularly in the new century. And <clears throat> let me say that on the other hand, there is much, you know, particularly at the end of the Cold War, there was a great deal of uh, emphasis on how the UN should adopt a new agenda for change. And, that agenda for change at one stage uh, represented a certain amount of a kind of uh, <clears throat> sense among the major powers, particularly in the Western world, uh, that they had reached what they call the end of history, etc. And ideas like the colored revolutions, the Arab Spring, and the, and the, 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 the hearkening of a, a new era of governance, etc. came about. But most of these tended to be perverted as a result of, as a result of the UN of the major powers using these uh, these developments in a sense for their own narrow agendas and it was i would suggest that it was the hubris of the big powers that actually prevented some of the major transformations from going into a much more <clears throat> a much more open and uh, let's say freer much more uh, a, a world of greater international harmony and that was because, uh, particularly after the, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the end of the Cold War and the, the push for uh, building greater consolidation among the states of the developing world, which were increasingly becoming fragile, suffering from internal fragility. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and there was the, the, the focus of even of peacekeeping began to be on internal uh, consolidation. And here, the agendas of the big powers resulted in hubris on the one hand, double standards, divisions among the P5, lack of sustained attention, uh, in, and of course, uh, lack of a, an ability to appreciate the genuine aspirations of the developing world. And thus you saw that very, very good concepts like responsibility to protect international, the development of international humanitarian law tended to be in a sense, different, differently interpreted, and then uh, brought about a whole series of social disruptions, uh, disorders, uh, fragmentation, terrorism, the uh, the whole sis the situation of migration and xenophobic nationalism. You see this developing in the current world now, uh, particularly uh, in in places like Libya, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, uh, the Sahel, and Central Africa. Now, this is the broad uh, ambit, as it were, of all the developments in the world. Today, uh, in a sense, the UN itself has changed. It is more the nature of international society has changed, and the UN has changed with it. Uh, the UN today has increasingly sought to focus on the first three words of the charter, we the people. The uh, United an International Organization like the UN is essentially a forum of states. It is the states that have a vote, not the people. But yet, today the UN has changed substantially to be more than just a collection of member states. It has increasingly 
given a role to civil society through the work of NGOs, through phil to philanthropic organizations, and even to business groups. And on many issues, particularly those outside the purview of peace uh, and security, are increasingly being uh, addressed and, be, and the cooperation of civil society, of business groups, philanthropic groups uh, are being increasingly being uh, sought. And I think they do play a, a very important role. Now, side by side with that, of course, you see that the world has become so much more interconnected. There's the digital revolution. There are issues like climate change, international health issues, food issues, which have, and financial uh, and trade uh, relationships and linkages which have actually made the world very much more intertwined, interconnected, interlinked, and interdependent. And that is at this time that we are now seeing also some of the, <clears throat> some of the baneful effects, as it were, of this interconnections, this interconnected society, which is not working for all uh, people all around the world. And I think, therefore, you have been seeing over the past few years an increasing movement a retraction, a movement away from globalization, from uh, the interconnections. And we are seeing people wanting to build protectionist barriers, etc. I think <clears throat> this is something which, in a sense, is a reaction to what is perceived as not working for some of the those countries that have been most affected adversely by these developments. But uh, I don't think that the <clears throat> that the globalization or the, the, the interdependencies of the world can actually be set back. You cannot put the genie back into the bottle. And in that sense, I think what the world must look forward is to build more and more uh, on the interdependencies and provide to the most vulnerable a set of global public goods, which can be used equitably and fairly by all people around the world. <clears throat> and I think these ideas like human security, et cetera, have increasingly come about. Now, <clears throat> I think today, uh, the pandemic has, in a sense, the, even, under, even before the sustainable development, the sustainable development goals were being discussed, there was also a major involvement of the international community in what is called the uh, disaster risk reduction and mitigation efforts. Uh, <clears throat> which was held in Japan. And I think these, uh, there has been re involvement in what may be called the, the trans, the, 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 the effects of, uh, <clears throat> of public health, of public, uh, of food and food security, of poverty, et cetera, around the world, and which will be, in a sense, affecting the most vulnerable. And it is the, despite the fact that lessons had been learned initially both in the, uh, in the Ebola crisis in Africa, as well as in the SARS crisis, these lessons, when it came to applying them, there were major problems when the, in the case of the latest COVID. And in that sense, the health crisis of, of COVID last year has shown, and this year, has shown us that <clears throat> the, less, the, the, the more we experience these things, the less we learn from it. And it is important, just as in the case of other issues, as in the case of, uh, of human rights issues around the world, uh, they tend to repeat. They're the same kind of uh, faults tend to repeat ourselves. And therefore, it is important that the world now look at the impact of disasters, of climate change events in a more holistic manner. What is required today is a global response. And as you say, just, as you probably know, just two, three days ago, the Deputy Secretary General did, uh, uh, did address a major meeting uh, on what he, on, on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the COVID challenge. And he called, and she, she called for building <clears throat> uh, the response in terms of whether it was uh, vaccines, access to vaccines, whether it was access to diagnostics, or whether it's access to therapeutics in terms of, uh, uh, of how to address the effects, the worldwide, the painful effects of COVID-19, this should be treated as a global public good. And increasingly, all countries should have 
access, equitable access to these in line with their requirements. And it should not be left to the whims of the marketplace and to go, go to those who have the, uh, have the uh, let's say, the biggest pockets. And in that sense, I think the World Bank has already come up with uh, a uh, what is called the Access to COVID Treatment Accelerator uh, uh, sort of program, which uh, I think they've put a certain amount of money or some 12 billion or so to be able to be accessed by the most vulnerable, the least, uh, the least developed countries in order to be able to uh, address the public health challenges that the COVID-19 has raised for most countries. Now, it is therefore important uh, looking forward to accept uh, that there has to be a global response to many of these public health challenges, both the first degree challenges as well as the second and third degree challenges, and the impact these challenges will have on the larger economies, on the food availability, on the, <clears throat> on the economic developments of um, the vulnerable countries. And therefore, it has to, <clears throat> it has to have, there has to be not just a, a global response, but within countries, within societies, a whole of society response. And I think that must be something, it is, it is increasingly to be agreed that while individual nations, individual countries will have to obviously to attend to the concerns of their own people, it must be done within the context of an interest that transcends narrow national interests. And therefore, it must be more inclusive and, and, and include the, request, the requirements of the most vulnerable. And <clears throat> there must be a, be a better balanced burden sharing, as it were, between the, uh, the costs of being able to, uh, uh, to address the requirements of this particular uh, global pandemic. <clears throat> therefore, what is needed uh, especially among those who have the capacities, is not greater muscularity in terms of treatment and, and uh, addressing the problems raised by uh, both, I, I, but, but not just the, the health-related issues, but the larger economic, financial, and even political impact of uh, the COVID-19. What is required is not more muscularity, but greater smartness. And here, I think when you say, when you say smart, uh, a smart response, the smart response, I mean, in terms of what, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, some, many of you have heard about a person named Inga Call, who was in the UNDP several years ago. She talked about what may be called smart sovereignty. Even sovereignty should be exercised increasingly in what, we, what she calls a smart way. There may be occasions when individual countries will have to give in a little in terms of what they may strictly speaking call their own national sovereign kind of areas of their within their national sovereignty in order to be able to extract a greater degree of, uh, <clears throat> of benefit from the, uh, from the larger purpose, the larger multilateral uh, sort of cake as it were, in order to be able to make the cake bigger and therefore be able to do benefit all communities. And in that sense, I mean smartness in that sense. And that smartness will, a very important component of that smartness is inclusivity and equality of consideration. And of course, uh, it is important, particularly in the context of what has been happening recently, for there to be no sense of exceptionalism. <clears throat> I think as we look into the, into the future now, uh, I have a few points which I need to make in addition to this question of meeting challenges in a smart way with, uh, with respect to being able to provide greater outlay uh, of funds and a better way of handling them. Uh, I, think, I think there has to be some structural, uh, a, a relook at the structure. And that is where I say the basic structure of the United Nations if the UN is to be credible for another 25 or 50 years at the very least, I think there has to be a certain relook at the basic structure. As I said in the at the outset itself, there has been a change, a basic change in the world today, in the structure of world politics today, 
and though there has been of course people like Deng Xiaoping in the in the in the late uh, 80s and early 90s in when uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, visited China I recall because I was part of the delegation I was joint secretary in the in the East Asia division when he did that uh, <clears throat> the two leaders when they met uh, they did look forward to what he calls what uh, Deng Xiaoping said the 21st century will not be an Asian century if it does not include the development of both India and China, China and India, as he said then. Today, of course, the situation under Xi Jinping is slightly different because the Chinese have been able to leverage both their place in the United Nations as a permanent member of the, of the uh, Security Council, but also by leveraging some of the benefits that they have been able to negotiate in uh, forums like the WTO to actually build up over the last 20 or 30 years an incredible amount of economic development. And I think they've, they've been able to leverage all the advantages of the political relationships they had developed with the West in a manner where their economy has speeded forward so, 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 so fast that uh, even the earlier restraint, the so-called uh, <clears throat> biding your time uh, strategy, which Deng Xiaoping had talked about, has now been completely set aside. And China is now very openly and somewhat muscularly using wolf, war diplomacy, wolf uh, warrior diplomacy and things like that, which to some extent has actually uh, uh, been even counterproductive. My own uh, impression is in the UN has been that the Chinese over the past decade or so has actually uh, worked, uh, it has actually in a sense upped, has increased, growth its profile, its, uh, its uh, cont financial contributions. There was a time when it was among the, among the latter lower half of the, uh, of the contributors to the regular budget. Today, it is the second largest contributor to the regular budget. It is also the second largest contributor to the peacekeeping budget. So China has actually developed in a great, in a big way. But I think it is important, uh, as, as, as I think recently, it is important not just to be there as a big player, but it has today the United Nations, you have to take the community, the larger community of member states also with you. And while it is true that the Chinese have begun to pose almost an alternative, uh, an alternative uh, uh, kind of uh, format, as it were, or an alternative uh, uh, st structure, I don't think that that kind of alternative is the, the change that I haven't, that I was thinking of. It has to be something that will work with most countries, not just meet the interests of one or two major countries. Therefore, you need to, uh, <clears throat> you need to have, uh, you, I, I'm not saying that we must disregard the reality of the power structure today. That is the position of the United States and China. In fact, I think the UN tends to obsess about it. But we need to consider that the United Nations must respond to the concerns of other powers, particularly the middle powers, more regularly. And as the restructuring of the, the Security Council is absolutely essential, I think that it has to be done eventually if the UN has to uh, achieve uh, or, or at least retain the credibility it has so far. Now, understanding the nuances of the present P5 position is one thing, but I think there are things where the United, the United Nations, particularly in the Secretariat, uh, and I've, 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 I've seen this at close hands, the United Nations Secretary General, for example, needs to not be caught up in the crosshair of the differences between the, uh, the various P5 members. As uh, one major uh, colleague of mine in the Secretary, in the Secretariat, uh, Brahimi, Lakhdar Brahimi said, the Security Council must be told what it needs to hear, not what would it, it would like to hear. And I think that is perhaps the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest need of the hour, particularly uh, in the context of uh, the, 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 in, the increasing uh, role which the United Nations Secretariat has to uh, take 
with regard to uh, working outside the parameters of member states alone. And therefore, it has to speak frankly when the, there is a disjunct between what is happening and what the, the, secu the Security Council permanent members uh, uh, would like to happen. And I think that uh, <clears throat> today, uh, that sense of being able to show the mirror to the, to the, to the Security Council is not being performed as effectively as it should. Uh, I recall, for example, the very, uh, the very, uh, in a sense, uh, the very one of the reasons why I was called to the United Nations, I was asked to join the Secretariat in 2000, uh, 2006, was at a time the last year of Kofi Annan's Secretary Generalship, which was in a sense uh, a year of uh, of considerable. Uh, uh, difficulty for him because uh, he had faced considerable pressure as a result of his own statements, his own uh, his own criticism of the United States action, uh, the U.S. Uh, government's action in uh, in Iraq, which uh, he which is done outside the United Nations, but which he in fact at one stage even described as illegal, and it was this uh, the this the 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 ire of the permanent member, the most powerful member of the Security Council, which actually resulted in a wholesale, uh, in a sense, almost a recasting of the senior management of the United Nations. And uh, many of the people whom he had worked on earlier were out of the 38th floor. And uh, uh, in, in some ways, I think it was to, re, to, in a sense, to set the balance right that uh, he had asked for uh, uh, some of the some of the some of uh, some of the senior diplomats or ambassadors from the non-aligned countries like India to join him, and I I, I was witness to uh, a, a kind of uh, a kind of a an attempt to recenter, as it were, the work of the Secretariat without losing his dignity. And I think uh, I do rec uh, uh, I do recognize. That Kofi Annan, the late Kofi Annan, was perhaps uh, one of the one of the two or three most charismatic secretary generals that we have had in uh, modern history. Uh, the other being, of course, uh, uh, of course, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, who, of course, died in 1962 again, uh, having gotten into the crosshairs of uh, important members of the uh, of the of the organization. Now, I think the Secretariat has therefore to be a lot more neutral as it moves forward. And it, <clears throat> it has to, of course, uh, work. Uh, it cannot, uh, uh, I think there are a whole series of the appointments, the, the way in which it, uh, it, uh, it works with the, with, the, with, the security, with the Security Council, mainly on political affairs, but more, more broadly, the way in which the, the, the Secretariat the UN Secretary works with the with the specialized agencies uh, is to provide a much greater degree of let's say political direction. I don't mean political in a narrow sense. A political direction to the various uh, uh, specialized agencies in order to move it, uh, move them towards the the, the uh, a broader uh, let's say uh, inclusivity towards meeting the the the, the needs of the world. And I think. That is now being done. The new Secretary General Guterres has actually brought out a much greater degree of uh, reform, which uh, works both at the country level in terms of the reorganization of the, of the work of the resident coordinators and how they react, the way, way in which the regional organizations are working, and how the, uh, the headquarters works vis-a-vis -vis the field. And I think there is a much greater degree of, uh, let's say, synergy which is now being brought about. But this synergy is not only, it's possible only if there is much greater, uh, much greater degree of, let's say, uh, consultation and consensus building, which includes more than just the P5. The P5 remain, there is no doubt today, the major movers and shakers of uh, the United Nations, not just in the political field, but even in the uh, non-political field. Some of it is not necessarily, uh, uh, let's say, uh, deleterious, because I think, uh, for example, 
uh, you will probably know that it was this year that the World Food Program was awarded the nuclear peace, uh, the the Nobel Peace Prize. I think the you know as you probably know. The United States is one of the largest funders of the of the world of the World Food Program, and I think the World Food Program, by and large, has been working in a highly non-politicized manner. It is one of the foremost, uh, let's say, humanitarian organizations. It has a, a, a very, let's say, lean budget. It has very not as many members. I mean, not many, not staffed as much as as uh, the food, uh, the FAO, and others, but. it works uh, with a whole series of other humanitarian organizations in very imaginative ways and i think that is the kind of uh, the kind of uh, the, the the kind of uh, so let's say uh, governance that uh, it that suggests itself increasingly for most of the other specialized programs also and i think uh, from this point of view i think there is there's been there's, there's some other small issues but i think what is most important is that the unite the uh, the uh, the united nations in its build up for the 75th anniversary had actually started a whole public media engagement program called un at 75 and i think the most interesting that they've tried to do is to they said that what we want to want to do is to listen increasingly to the people of the world and i think that has been a very interesting program that it has for almost a, a year and i think it has been it has helped the un to integrate itself very much more with the sentiment in particularly in the social media and other parts of the world in some ways uh, i have uh, i have not been okay with the developments i am a bit of a dinosaur in terms of the in terms of the social media i have not at all been uh, clipped onto the social media but the un has been very active on the social media and in that sense i think it is increasingly now finding it is able to Uh, to feel as it were the sentiments around the world what is happening on a on an almost an immediate basis and i think it is important not to be carried away of course by these temporary and these these immediate sentiments but at the same time to be able to get a pulse of where the people of of the world are moving what the indications are and how they view the work of the un the work of the major powers and the work particularly or that is not done has remains to be done in meeting the uh, the expectations and requirements of the most vulnerable people the refugees the uh, <clears throat> the people who are who are actually the the even the the environment refugees the people who are actually on the wrong side and the people who have a migration have migrated these are the kind of populations that need the attention of the world and it is and it is they are the ones who suffer the most and if the united nations is not be not able to reach them they will they will suffer by the road side and it is from that point of view that even the sdg slogan of leave no one behind it finds a great deal of resonance and i think it is this particular on the one hand the sdgs the other the disaster the disaster risk reduction then the humanitarian activities of uh, in the in the food and other and uh, disease etc and of course the united nations on the political and development side this i think is the future that we need to safeguard and i end by by probably end by saying that the united nations then when it was founded as now despite all its difficulties is an indispensable organization i don't think you can do without the united nations you may find a lot of fault with it you may criticize it i think you must criticize it you may find that their criticism that the united nations criticism of individual countries or individual governments at some times and at at various on various occasions are very embarrassing and you don't like to hear it just as uh, i think uh, when yesterday uh, president trump talked about how filthy the, <laughs> the environment in india is obviously you don't like it but i think there is some truth somewhere in it which you need to at least turn your eyes on and be able to at least reflect on it and if you can reflect on it i think the un will have done it to have done some uh, something useful my own sense is i think there is an incredible amount of uh, of uh, ins inspirational figures in the united nations the united the idea of multilateralism itself i think is something that that needs to be needs to be uh, be, be cherished 
and it is important however much we may have difficulties in our bilateral relations or in our multilateral ties the criticism we face i think there is no uh, there is no uh, there is no uh, uh, substitute for a multilateral world which is the world of the future anyway that is my take as it were for you uh, youngsters it is it is for you now to take this process forward i after having spent 11 years in the united nations now i fi i find myself a little out of date now so if there are any questions i'll be glad to hear from you thank you thank you sir for your intellectually enriching words and bestowing upon us a casket of precious knowledge uh now the house is open to questions uh, if you have any question then you can use the reaction option on the on zoom uh, on the bottom of your screen and i'll ask you to unmute and ask your question and till the time uh, we have some questions from yt uh first question is from pragya pragya you unmute a very good afternoon Sir, thank you so much for such an enlightening session. Yes. Yeah. So question is, as you all know, that in the contemporary context, one of the very few positive outcomes have been the environmental optimism. So, how do you think that it will help UN and related uh, institutions to fulfill their goals and roles, and as you mentioned, SDGs related to tackling the climatic hazards that uh, we are facing globally at present? well i think uh, <clears throat> the the whole question of environment of how to address environment is largely a question of mobilization it's largely a question of bringing greater awareness i mean much of the much of the awareness or the lack of awareness that we see at governmental levels is not because of lack of information it is because of political uh, a certain amount of political blindness or color blindness in 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 some ways uh, some Uh, governments just do not see green anywhere uh, they can see they can see everything else but no. now that is not that's more like what mahatma gandhi said you can't uh, you can't uh, awaken a person who's pretending to sleep you can only awaken a person if he's sleeping but i think by and large around the world there is a strong sense uh, there is this an, an absence of of information about what processes are workable and what processes are not workable now it is true that in countries like like india there is both a sense there is a dilemma in terms of is development more important or is it important for us is environment more important this is a false choice this is actually a false choice now it is important that when when you are finger pointing countries like india it is very sensitive when you say that india is not doing this the developed countries do that who face a lot of responsibility for bringing out this place this problem in the first place and when they point the finger there is a certain degree of sensitivity but at the same time there it, it i think most develop, most uh, decision makers in india are fairly clear that they are responsible for the impact of developmental choices that they make on the environment and it is important that they take the choices that are least energy Uh, that 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 the most energy intensive and least carbon sort of uh, intensive in that sense and i think uh, while there there are countries which are able to do it when in in areas where they are not able to do it particularly in in the case of the sids and of the ldcs it is important that they get the financial uh, resources from the more developed part of the world in order to do it and i think this is what the what a proper sense of understanding environmental options should consist of and i think this uh, as 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 i think the, in the last at last september in september 2019 uh, there was a summit in september where the secretary general precisely said that it is important that you look that you have greater degree of ambition in terms of meeting environmental targets Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. Next up, we have Tarsh. Tarsh, uh, if you are here. Uh, yeah. 
sir my question is after the pandemic will we witness a sort of uh, a shift in power in the united nations and can it somehow affect the permanent members now uh, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting question you asked now are you talking about a shift in power uh, uh, in terms of uh, within the uh, p5 or you are talk talk about shift of power affecting the p5 now i am a little reluctant to suggest that this pandemic would actually result in a major power shift uh, uh, around the world or in the un uh, of course there is over the years there has been a slow a slow in a sense a revolution taking place particularly in the way in which china has been asserting itself in the united nations and that will continue there is no doubt as far as i can see if anything that uh the the covid has had some implications for that in terms of how china has reacted in the first place as well as in later in terms of how it has responded in terms of its its uh, work with other countries this is both some positive signs and some negative signs and i'm sure that that will impact and it has actually impacted uh in terms of the the image the china projects around the world particularly in the in the united nations uh, in in the international community as a whole and in the united nations too but i will hesitate to say that there will be any major dramatic effects the dramatic effects will actually i think be nationally known nationally seen and then if there is a major change in the united states for example that will that will obviously be seen in the way in which the united nations is treated by the united states government the subsequent government that comes now for example walking out of uh, organizations the united nations mind you uh, the united states mind you is still the largest contributor to the uh, to the uh, un budget it is also uh, no secret that uh, new york as a city gains a lot by the fact that it is the center of the uh, that the un headquarters is in new york but at the same time i think that there is there's a there's a very there's a huge amount of goodwill for the united nations inside the united states also now this must be leveraged i think for more productive purpose rather than what we have been seeing over the past uh, few years particularly under the trump where the united states has viewed the united nations with a great deal of cynicism and i think while it is true that there is there is need for a very of a careful scrutiny of what is happening and uh, of what is happening whether in, the, in 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 terms of management in terms of programs in terms of of uh, processes in terms of people yes there should be that but uh, when the when a country like the united states starts divesting itself of international commitments i think that vacuum is is actually filled up by others and sometimes that is filled up not necessarily for the good of these organizations and or for good of multilateralism in general <clears throat> thank you sir thank you for your answer um tarsh do you have any follow up questions or are you satisfied with the answer well i might say that you know this you know I, uh, there there are some people who talk about middle powers and things like that these will happen and there is the united nations though i have given the impression that it is the p5 that is that is that runs the show in in the united nations in on most issues it is only partly true uh, even they have to face up in the general assembly and in many in the ecosoc in the economic and social council too uh, it is not possible for them to ride roughshod over the over the views of other members and i think there are some incredibly active Uh, diplomats in the multilat in the in uh, from smaller countries as you know uh, <clears throat> the uh, oh, what is it was it tuvalu was it uh, samoa yeah i think it was one country the per the permanent representative the ambassador of one country a small country like samoa or is it tuvalu i don't i'm not so sure who in copenhagen during the in, in uh, during the cop 15 was able to completely in a sense uh, halt Whole, the juggernaut that was coming in terms of a kind of a uh, the uh, a kind of a uh, an understanding and agreement which was actually uh, worked out from outside by by the by the great powers including india and 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 china and others but 
they found, Samoa found that that was not working to his advantage and they just completely stymied it. So it's not necessarily uh, true that, you know, they, 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 that the great, that the big power, the powerful people get their work all the time. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your response. Yeah. Uh, second, uh, third, we have uh, Adiraj. Do we have Adiraj here? Yes. Um, good afternoon, sir. So my question to you is, so the, as we know, the current world order is witnessing rise of China and the situation of Cold War between China and the US. So mm -hmm. sir, considering this situation, do you think the effectiveness of UN would eventually decrease? Uh, it's difficult. I'm not, I'm not going to say that the eff effective, the influence of the UN will decrease because of the fight between China and the US. Now, it is possible that that may logjam a lot of programs inside the UN. Uh, again, there are programs and programs. There are a number of... Now, it, in a sense, uh, I don't know what, whether this is what you're suggesting. The, the Chinese have, over the past years, taken a fairly strong, strident uh, pro, uh, sort of actions in the UN. They today pay around 12% of the, of the regular budget. And... Uh, they actually <clears throat> are, see, are heading four organizations in the UN, the FAO, the UNIDO, the ITU, and the ICAO. And they tried to get the fifth, the W, uh, WIPO, and which, of course, didn't succeed because of the very, very strong uh, uh, opposition uh, put up by the, uh, by the US and others, and the West particularly, and uh, by putting up the candidature of Singapore. And uh, even in... In other, in even in some of the uh, uh, sort of uh, elections that took place recently for the for the uh, the Council of Women, actually, I the, the, there is uh, I think just recently the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, China lost to India. India was uh, was was able to get to, uh, and later on, in fact, uh, around the same time, China also lost to Samoa in the for entry into the Statistical Commission. Uh, China lost to Singapore, as I said, in the candidate of the uh, WIPO. Now, uh, these, are, these show that irrespective of the, uh, the bilateral competition, the rivalry, the Cold War, the uh, decoupling that you are seeing, uh, or the, I wouldn't say Cold War, incipient Cold War, uh, that we are seeing uh, you know, almost uh, on the horizon between China and the United States, in the, United, in the United Nations, there is a slightly different dynamic that works. And uh, I think that, that dynamic is affected, but it's also leveraged by countries. And they take the best, they make the best advantage of it. And it is important for countries like China and the United States to, to realize that they need to work with a large number of countries together and uh, build coalitions. And I think that is a process which is doing, which is handled by both countries, of course, very effectively. As you know, the uh, the BRI, the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, is of course handled by China with various countries on a separate footing. But there are many ways in which the Chinese are trying to, in a sense, implicate the United Nations also in some of these programs. Of course, they face uh, some hurdles. They face differences from. Uh, from the United, uh, from uh, other countries, including the West, and in, on some occasions, India has also uh, post uh, has made some drafting changes, etc., where there is too overt and too what we feel unjustified references to Chinese concepts, as it were, which in a sense detract, like a uh, community of uh, common destiny and things like that. There have been uh, occasions when the Chinese have faced differences, but this is not to suggest that uh, they are not making very strong inroads in the United Nations, they are doing it. And that is being done by all countries, including India. And I think India is, is still fairly active in the United and fairly influential in the, in the, in the United Nations. And I think that's, it's a kind of a, a balance that on the whole is actually improving the effectiveness of uh, multilateral diplomacy in the United Nations. And I think that will continue. I wouldn't say it will be affected very bad. It will make the UN ineffective. If the UN is ineffective, it will be for some other reasons. It won't be for this. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, Adiraj, do you have the follow-up or it's fine?
just one small question yeah. sir after world war 1 so the league of nations were um, was uh, constructed so that it could it could prevent the world war 2 but despite of that it still happened so but so and so now we know that the superpowers are they now have nuclear weapons also and sir if by chance a war broke out sir if they use that nuclear powers the atrocities and the casualties will be absolutely brutal so just sir uh, un can the un avoid world war 3 if situations get very worse between the two countries is well, this china let, or any other country let me say that so far 75 years the un has survived and avoided a world war of course it is there have been a large number of uh, uh, a, a nuclear holocaust has been averted and let me tell you that the as you said the world went to, from the first world war we we descended very steeply into a second world war very soon despite the league of nations but you know the league of nations did not include the united states now how do you have an international organization it's like it's a like a this thing um, uh, you know uh, hamlet without the prince of denmark and things like that that was one thing secondly the uh, the, uh, the soviet union left the united well left the league of nations in 1934 so these are the things and that is where i said the reality of the organization and in fact it was for that reason essentially that you had the status of the permanent members and the p5 etc and i think that is important it's important that you recognize the reality of the power structure in the world the fact is today that power structure is changing and it is important that that change one minute uh that uh, that that reality has to be recognized if you try to take measures without reference to the real world then i think the the, the united nations will follow the same path as the league of nations and that is the point i am making now that there is a structural change that has taken place a major change which has taken place in the balance of the world in recent times uh, which includes india and china there's no doubt about it and of course for the present i think the 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 change that is taking place has not affected india has not affect has not included india because i think the the change has not become so disruptive india is still able to work within the world but if if it a time comes when our interests are actually are not sustained are subserved by our participation in the in the in the world organization or in fact they the world organization goes continuously on a path which is completely different from ours it will be important for countries like india to wonder whether it's it, the interest is worth whether the whether the uh, interest of the world is is subserved by this kind of an organization or by another organization i don't think i hope that it doesn't happen i don't think it will happen i think that the un will see the light by that time and there will be reasonable and important uh, reform which will take place in the united nations thank you sir yeah. uh, okay so we have the last question uh, of the day from piyush jorwal i'd like you to unmute yourself and ask the question please jorwal aish i think there is some technical problem here uh, and uh, i think due to technical problem he left the meeting oh so... <laughs> okay okay it's fine we can take one more question then okay i have another question it's from varalika the question is that the big tech companies such as google microsoft apple amazon fb have monopolistic holds over a large amount of economic income of the world it is unlikely that us will work towards regulating these giants so should the un step in to help startups build themselves in the post pandemic world So that's a very interesting question but i do you probably know the us is already taking action against google in the last few days now i don't know whether that is the kind of action that you are thinking of that should be taken second is uh the, uh the 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 question is how does the un take action against individual uh, uh, companies as it were because companies fall under the ambit of national law it doesn't come under international law unless it it, it violates some kind of international uh, uh in some kind of international um, uh, sort of covenant or com- convention or things like that now 
the UN's work, particularly as involves as is, involves this kind of these kind of important uh, companies, will be to evolve or to construct a framework of multilateral commitments and and uh, agreements which will meet the needs of all countries, which will prevent the outsized or, or, or disproportionate influence by some companies like Google or like Amazon and things like that, and build for a better playing field, a, a more level playing field among all countries and all and help the vulnerable or the and and give scope for some kind of uh, protective measures. Now that will be in the shape of an international understanding. And that cannot be done by the UN alone. It has to be done by all the member states through the UN. Now, the UN can do it from that point of view, but it can't directly work with individuals. It can't, it can't really haul up one company or two companies and say these are that becomes invidious and it's unlikely to be actually countenanced. Even if it is justified, I don't think national country, national governments will agree to that kind of a, a kind of a treatment. Thank you, sir. On the other hand, through the global, there are the, the global, you know, the global compact and things like that. The, the United Nations has a series of agreements and understandings with important companies, and there they can evolve a kind of a, 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 a kind of a regime which all parties will be committed to, and that will help. That is how it goes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So with this, we have uh, come to an end of the final session of Prithant. Thank you so much, sir, for this enriching and uh, didactic session and going thoroughly with your answers and explaining us in each and every intricacies of the uh, structural uh, structure of UN. Thank you. Now, now I would like to call upon the Vice President of uh, Political Science Students Association, Swamya Sharma, for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ayush. Uh, first of all, a very uh, good afternoon to one and all present here with us. So I think it is fair to conclude that the conclave was a great success. So on behalf of the entire political science department, I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Vijay Ambya sir for being here and enlightening us about the future of UN in the post-pandemic world. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful and informative session. We loved having you. It was an honor listening you. to a refreshing perspective on this. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ambassador Dilip Sinha, sir, Professor CSR Muthi, sir, and Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh, sir, for gracing our event as our esteemed speakers. And at last, so many people have contributed in so many ways to make sure that the conclave was, uh, was a success. So firstly, I'd like to express our deep sense of appreciation for our principal, Dr. S. Venkat, sir, for bestowing upon us the opportunity of organizing the conclave. And obviously, a big thanks to the professors for their guidance and support that they have provided throughout. We wouldn't have been able to do this without them. I'd also like to express heartfelt gratitude to all those who joined in for, the, for all the conclave sessions. I hope it was an enriching experience for all of you as well. And also thanks to all those who participated in the competitions with great enthusiasm. And at last, since we all know no man is an island, I'd like to thank my fellow association members as it is because of our collective efforts and tenacity that this event was made possible. And I know this speech has been full of thanks, but our hearts are filled with nothing but only gratitude right now. So finally, thank you so much everybody for making Britain's vocalizing visions, our first ever department conclave, a huge success. We couldn't have been we wouldn't have been able to do this without each one of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I, I, you, Mr. CSR, uh, I think he, Murthy has had an article in the Hindu today. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I read about it. Yeah. That's great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, sir. you can end the live stream also i think yeah 